Are you ready to explore exciting careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies? Then join me, your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K, and my amazing guests on the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Discover what it takes to turn the impossible into reality. Tune in now to a thrilling episode number 32. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, get ready to be inspired and amazed as we welcome Catherine Lapp to the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Catherine is a director of neuroscience at Next Team, who is not afraid to tackle the toughest challenges in her field. With her unique blend of passion, creativity, and determination, she's been making waves in the world of neuroscience and is on a mission to unlock the secrets of transcranial brain stimulation and apply this to improve surgical and clinical outcomes. So sit back, relax, and get ready to be educated as Catherine shares her incredible journey and insights with us. Welcome, Catherine. It's such a pleasure to have you on our podcast today. Thank you. Can you give us a quick introduction and let our listeners know where you are joining us from and share any interesting facts or information about the place or institution you are associated with? Absolutely. So thank you so much for that really nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, As Melina said, I'm Kate Lapp, and I'm coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. And I work for a medical device company called Nextim that's actually based out of Helsinki, Finland. And we specialize in non-invasive brain stimulation using a technique called Navigated Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation, or NTMS. And so I think what's really interesting about Nextim is that historically, if you wanted to accurately target specific structures using brain stimulation, it's meant that we've actually had to open up part of the skull and directly stimulate the brain itself, which is obviously very invasive. So what makes Nexim so special is that we're actually able to get a very similar level of accuracy, but non-invasively. So it's really opened up a new level of hope for people who are being evaluated for high-risk neurosurgeries, as well as those individuals who are looking for neuromodulation treatment, um, perhaps as an alternative to medication. Thank you very much, Catherine. And your introduction brought me to actually already two very interesting memories. One of them is Helsinki, Finland, where I did my PhD thesis. And I was attending lectures of Professor Risto Maniemi on magnetoencephalography. So, because that was the part of my uh, thesis. What a small world. That's our founder. That is the founder of our company. Um, It's incredibly small world. (laughs) Absolutely. I agree. And I was still studying there at that time when Professor Ilmaniemi was the head of our Biomac laboratory where I was doing my thesis. Amazing. And you also mentioned invasive brain stimulation which is a part of what I was involved in partially for over 11 years of my work with the epilepsy surgery. So actually, we had that means of evaluation for epilepsy surgery, and I was working on developing certain approaches that can replace invasive brain stimulation. So we we were working on real-time functional mapping your approach is even less invasive because we even don't need to go at all into a brain to open the skull, but we can stimulate a brain non-invasively. I think that's a fascinating area and definitely it has so much potential to improve surgery comes and make surgeries much safer for the patients. Absolutely. It's amazing how much you know. Um, uh, this is really fun to to chat with you about all of this because they are both so needed, both approaches, the invasive approach and the non-invasive approach. So yeah, exciting. Yes, 
very exciting and I'm very curious to know who did you want to be when you were growing up? Does it coincide in any possible ways with with what you are doing right now? (laughs) Well, when I was really, really young, I'm pretty sure that I wanted to I don't know, be a Thundercat or maybe the next MacGyver. But I think by the time I was in first grade, it was pretty apparent to my teachers, I'd probably go into engineering. It wasn't so much that I was a real nerd about math, I just really had so much fun with it. And by the time I got into maybe middle school and high school, I was still having so much fun with math and science. But then I started having these opportunities where I actually got to help people. So I was working in a lifeguard And I also started shadowing different medical professionals and working with children who had neurological disorders. And so I think even though I was pretty young, you know, in high school, these opportunities really made something resonate with me. And it was so strong that I knew that helping people and helping patients was really a core part of me. And so then I started having a lot of trouble figuring out what I wanted to do for college because I had these two separate passions developing, right? One very technical and the other very clinical. And I had absolutely no idea how to put those two things together. And because I was coming from a really small town in Massachusetts, um, nobody I knew um, knew how to put those things together either. And it really took me until maybe my early to mid twenties before I was introduced to the field of neuroscience and saw that, you know, this was the answer. Yes, that's so important what you mentioned, that you were having fun with math and (laughs) science. I like that because when you are having fun, you are even not really noticing all the challenges that come to it because each challenge is just another fun adventure. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a very good approach to really keep in mind when doing math, doing science, to take it as a fun opportunity to explore, especially when, when you are studying at school. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah, thank you. Can you tell how did you get into the field where you are specializing now? What really inspired you to pursue this career in neurotechnology? What was your journey to this field? Yeah, so I studied physics in undergrad, um, and then I also enrolled into grad school for physics. But actually, just before the first semester began in grad school, I showed up for, we had this open house night where we were supposed to tour all the different labs and then decide our subspecialty. Um, And ultimately that decision was going to decide our entire future career. But as I was going through those different labs, all of my choices were like particle physics or astronomical physics. And I knew that in choosing any one of those, I was really setting myself up for a life without meaning because it was never going to be about helping patients. And so it was a really tough decision, but I withdrew from grad school before the first day. And I decided to start old school networking to try to figure out where I should take my life. And as cheesy as it sounds, I think perhaps it was a bit of divine intervention how I got into neuroscience. So I was living in Colorado at the time and I started snowboarding a lot. And I was riding in the snowboard park a lot because that is just what you do when you live in Colorado. And um, one day I had a really bad fall and I I hit my head really, really hard. Um, there was a quite a bit of recovery period after that. And it was actually while I was still recovering that I met somebody who worked in neuroscience um, in academia. And we had some really great discussions and she opened up my eyes to this world of neurotech, which was clearly the answer to how I could integrate this technical background of mine with this real need to help patients. Um, And I would get to work with the brain, which was something that I was phenomenally curious about at that very moment. So she gave me the best advice and I would love to share it with you all. She said to learn a little bit about neuroscience before you go in and really study neuroscience. And it sounds pretty counterintuitive, right? But what she was getting at was 
there are so many subspecialties in neuroscience, right? You have genetics and you have biochem, there's computational modeling and functional imaging. Really, there's so many. And you really want to make sure that whatever subspecialty you choose, well, that is really exciting for you, right? Before you take all the time and the effort to master it. So my journey in this field is really about figuring out what I felt was important for the field, what was exciting to me, um, and then taking every opportunity I could to learn about it, um, and then ultimately figuring out how I wanted to contribute back. So after undergrad, um, I took her advice, and I went back to school. I studied neuroscience for a bit until I discovered just how powerful it was to integrate clinical neurophysiology data with imaging. And specifically, I was inspired by a graduate physics course I took where I did my semester project in MEG, magnetoencephalography, um, exactly what um, you were doing, Milena. So that really inspired me to seek out some more ways to learn about that. But unfortunately, the school that I was at didn't have any labs that were doing any of that kind of work. So I sought out internships elsewhere and I got this really amazing internship um, at the NIH in Bethesda. And I was doing language mapping, primarily doing fMRI, but we were also using some less used methods like articulography and MEG, right? So um, what got me interested in the first place um, into the field of neuroscience. So it was a really exciting day. I got to meet the MedCore laboratory. They ended up seeing just how passionate I was in the field and that I was already knowledgeable about MEG. Um, and so they decided to offer me a fellowship to stay on for another year, work with them as a technical ERTA. So an ERTA is a intramural research training ward. And so I want to make sure that all of you guys know that these programs exist because it was life-changing for me. So when you get into one of these programs at the NIH, they really give you as much opportunity to learn as you want. And when I was there, I was really hungry to learn just as much as I possibly could. Right, so you can take graduate courses, which I did, and they, they have these incredible mentors that will guide you through your early career. Um, you get to access amazing lectures all of the time, uh, but then you also get to shadow different researchers on campus to really feel out what different careers would be like different subspecialties would be like. And so from all of these experiences that I had at the NIH and within the MedCore laboratory, I realized that, you know, I, I liked doing the clinical research itself. I did. I really liked it. Um, but what I really loved was being able to test out new algorithms and to help the technology and the field of MEG advance. So when I was talking with my team and my mentors about where I wanted to take my career, they said, you know, if you want to go into the technology side, well, I probably learned more from working in the industry than I would after, you know, seven years in a PhD program. And well, I might as well just go straight to industry if I was probably going to end up there anyway. So based off of their advice, I did it. I just, I packed up my Jeep. I drove 3000 miles, planted myself right in the hub of neuroscience. So in San Francisco, just in hopes of having a career in the industry world, and then I just made it happen. And since then, I've gotten to work with the most amazing individuals. So I was working with UCSF Department of Neurosurgery, Mount Sinai Department of Neurosurgery. I've worked with multiple image-guided technology companies, both inside the OR and out. Um, I even went back to grad school along the way to study computer and electrical engineering. So that's really hardware that controls software, or software that controls hardware. And I was really focusing on neural applications like BCI. And I also had um, an additional clinical fellowship doing um, interoperative neurophysiological monitoring. So I was really trying to learn how to work with the more invasive techniques and really just to see what else we can do with these brain signals. So it's been really wonderful to have everything that I've been learning along the way really build upon itself. So it was, you know, starting out learning how to integrate the clinical neurophysiology data sets with the imaging, doing that at the NIH, and then going into neurosurgery and, and figuring out how to integrate every type of functional imaging data set you can imagine 
along with the clinical neurophysiology data sets, and putting that onto the surgical navigation systems and also launching those into the radiation oncology platforms. And then going a step above that was really trying to figure out which types of cases um, do we benefit the most from these types of technology integrations. And then now what I've been doing most recently is really working to tell the world about the benefits of these techniques um, for specific uses so that everybody's patients can benefit. So my career journey really has been an absolute incredible ride so far. Yes, it looks like it. And uh, in everything you say, I feel that passion, that initial passion from when you had fun with math and science. I think it continues throughout all your <laughs> journey. So <laughs> that's beautiful. Absolutely. It's been fun the whole time. It's been really, really fun. I think that's why you're doing such an amazing work because it is fun for you. It's enjoyable. And you bring all that with you all the way. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your advice and information for people who might not have access to this very unique methodologies that are not available everywhere, like magnetoencephalography. There are opportunities to go and study and get some experience at NIH in Bethesda. I know psychiatrists who did such work and learned the MG and now doing beautiful work with obsessive compulsive disorders and in investigating neural bases of OCD with magnetoencephalography. And in Europe, I know that always that hub where people were able to come was by a laboratory at the University of Helsinki Central Hospital and people were coming from all over the place and not only Europe but from Australia before purchasing the first MEG machines like Professor Patricia Michi was coming to Biomac and students from all over. So there are opportunities and there are places that are really welcoming new people to come and to learn. So Thank you. Thank you. Now it's time to tell about your company where you are working right now, the next team. Uh, can you tell our listeners about it? How did it develop and what is the history behind it? Yeah. So Nexum's founder, so Risto Mani, he is a very well-known expert in the MEG world. And so I didn't go into it before, but MEG, magnetoencephalography, that's where you're measuring the magnetic fields produced by neuronal activity. And you're using these sensors that are placed outside the head. And then TMS, like with Nexim, it's basically the opposite. So you're using a stimulator outside the head, and then you generate these electromagnetic fields to actually activate neurons in a very specific part of the brain. And so a lot of the mathematical modeling and the imaging integration that you've been optimizing in the MEG world, well, that was the basis for this very new form of TMS, the Nexum version of TMS, where for the first time, you could actually visualize where in the brain you were stimulating and then use mathematical modeling to make it very accurate. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And what was the first time to use navigation for transcranial magnetic stimulation with the next team where already some other approaches developed at that time when it started? There may have been some people um, playing around with it. The surgical navigation systems have been around for a long time. And so I imagine people had attempted to bring this in but these guys coming from the Meg world, they were actually able to do it very, very accurately, which is something that was brand new to the TMS world. Yes, absolutely. And can you tell us about your role as a director of neuroscience at Next Team? What your responsibilities entail? Sure. So director of neuroscience, that's a, um, a fairly ambiguous title, isn't it? So my job really entails elements of innovation and strategy and communication. So on the strategy side, well, you know, it's not enough in medical device to just build and then offer somebody a product. 
right? There are a lot of different people and groups that are involved in getting patients access to this kind of technology and care, right? So you have regulatory agencies like the FDA, you've got insurance companies and medical societies. Um, Obviously you have clinicians and patients. Um, And then internally you have your own staff. Um, And then depending on the type of technology you have and the indications um, that you're going after, there are often many, many other types of people involved. And so every one of these individuals and groups, they, they sort of play their own role in this ecosystem that's needed for patients to be able to have access to care. So on the strategy side, um, it's all about how to create and then nurture this kind of ecosystem. And then on the communication side, I really help out to figure, figure out what it's going to take for one, everybody in that ecosystem to know just how important this type of care is for patients. Um, but then two, everybody needs to also know exactly what they can do to help patients get the care that they need. And so then on um, the innovation side, well, innovation is all about identifying and creating value. And so just in general, that typically comes in three main ways. So one is um, how much new value can we create through the development of new tools? And for me, it's really fun to be part of R&D to help identify what we should be building. And then I actually periodically get to test out our products during that development process. So sometimes I'm testing it out in my own apartment with a special R&D setup. Um, and sometimes I'm doing usability testing and going out to customer sites and collecting their feedback to make sure we get it right before we actually finalize it and release it. And then another side of innovation is identifying new uses for the same technology, right? So my colleagues and I really try to figure out what it is that our users are doing because they're very, very innovative. We, we really try to stay on top of the field. And so when we do spot something that is particularly helpful and addresses you know, some major unmet need, then we do basically whatever needs to be done to facilitate advancing that research area so that patients can get access to this kind of care in a clinical setting and not just in a research lab. And then finally, innovation. It's also about just figuring out whether types of value can be created. And you can actually get really crafty with this. Um, It's really open-ended. You can use this on the business side or the product side. Um, But one of the ways I'm focused on right now really ties into that ecosystem framework, really understanding the needs of all of the different individuals, and then figuring out what type of valuable resources I can create to best support them. So sometimes this is on the regulatory or the payer side. Sometimes this means internal training materials. And then sometimes it means external resources for patients or physicians. Um, I typically call that like a supplementary product offering. Um, So anyway, my ambiguous title, I think, is more a reflection of the level of technical and clinical knowledge that's needed to be able to do all that. Thank you so much, Catherine. Now I would like to get into the core of what you are doing. It's transcranial magnetic stimulation. Can you first explain what transcranial magnetic stimulation is and what are the main clinical applications that are currently approved for using transcranial magnetic stimulation? Transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, that's where you're using a stimulator and it's called a coil. It's um, encased in a plastic piece that has a flat face about the size of the palm of your hand. And so you hold this flat surface against a patient's head and it generates a very focal and cone-shaped magnetic field that can pass through a patient's head non-invasively And then it works to activate neurons in a very specific area of the brain. And so there are multiple uses for the system. So you can stimulate different parts of the brain to determine what type of function it controls. So that's called brain mapping. Or you can use it as a neuromodulation tool to actually treat people with various conditions. And then um, there are also a bunch of different exciting uses, but those are still in the research phase. So I won't elaborate too much on those, um, but there are quite a number of other ways to use TMS as well. 
Yeah, thank you. Maybe you will talk later, but there is one use that is currently approved in uh, Europe, but not approved yet in the United States. Yes? Yeah. So there are, so we have FDA clearances in the United States for treating depression. And there are other manufacturers out there who are also getting additional clearances, mainly in the mental health space. But then next to him, um, not only do we have an FDA clearance for depression, which we got in 2017, um, but we're also working with chronic neuropathic pain. And so we have a CE mark in Europe, but we do not yet have an FDA clearance for that in the United States. But we are hoping that that's something that will be in the future. Um, you know, more than half of people with chronic neuropathic pain, they just don't get relief from any type of medication or for any treatment. So this is a very, very important to be able to offer something new for them, some hope for them. And so the idea behind using RTMS to treat chronic neuropathic pain is to really disturb the signals and maybe um, dampen them before they're actually registered in the cortex as pain. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let's get into the first major application of image-guided transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, and uh, how it is used to treat major depressive disorder, MDD, with the next team equipment. Yeah, absolutely. So first, I'll tell people a little bit about image guidance uh, technology, just in case you don't know. So um, image guidance technology, it's also called MRI guided technology, sometimes we refer to it as navigation. So basically the magic behind image guided technology is this process called registration. And so for registration, this system will actually create a 3D model of the patient's brain within the software using the patient's own MRI. And then it syncs up the coordinate system of that 3D model to a coordinate system that you give the patient sitting in the chair. And then once the patient is registered to their MRI, we have this infrared camera that's placed a few feet away and it will actually track the location of the stimulating coil in relation to the patient's head. And then the TMS operator can actually visualize where on the screen the location of the coil is and its stimulating E-field they could see it all on the 3D model of the brain. So this technology allows you to actually see where you're stimulating. And then also it's tracking your movements in real time. So as you move, you can see everything move on the screen. And so then when you're using this for depression, that's a case where it requires what's called RTMS. So R stands for repetitive. So you deliver a series of magnetic pulses to actually modulate neurons within a specific area of the brain. And so just in general, with one set of simulation parameters, you can work to dampen an overactive area of the brain. Or like in depression, um, it can use a different set of parameters to actually increase the excitability level in an underactive area of the brain. So for depression, Clinicians are targeting an area of the brain called the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or DLPFC. Um, that's an area of the brain that regulates mood and emotion. And they're doing this using high-frequency stimulation, and that has an excitatory effect. And what's neat is that we can actually see this DLPFC structure on a patient's MRI, and we can put a little digital marker on it. And so then you can use the image kind of technology to align your stimulator to this marker so that you can be sure that you're actually treating the intended target. And the next sim system is a high accuracy, high precision system. So you can actually make sure that you're staying within two millimeters of that intended target throughout the entire treatment. Um, and if the patient you know, moves in the chair or something, you can actually very quickly get your stimulator back into the right position again to make sure that you're always treating the intended spot. Yeah. yeah. And this definitely is very important because we can target a very specific area and we know what area we are targeting. And um, can you discuss the significance, yes, of using 3D navigation in TMS treatment and how maybe it's relation to possible improved outcomes, uh, treatment for depression. Is there any data available about that? 
Yeah. So um, there's a number of different TMS manufacturers out there, and they all um, use different ways to target the DLPFC. Um, some are more accurate than others. So the oldest way that doesn't use any type of navigation technology, so no MRI is used. Um, so you actually cannot see where in the brain you're stimulating. And so when you use what's called non-navigated TMS, the TMS operators are using a variety of locations on the patient's scalp to approximate where the anatomical structures are underneath. But, you know, as you know, everybody's brain is different. And there's actually a study done by Adop et al. back in 2010, where they show that if you're using the most common method to do this, it's called a five centimeter rule. It often lands people too far posterior, um, about two centimeters posterior on average. Um, and Penfield actually um, found out that the average width of, say, the motor gyrus is about 1.5 centimeters. So being two centimeters off, it's quite significant. And it actually tends to land people the premotor cortex instead of the DLPFC. Um, some other TMS systems out there, they will actually use this clip-on navigation technology that also falls short. And I don't have time to talk about all the reasons why, but I can highlight one of them, one of the main ones. So probably the most stunning capability Nextim offers is what we call electric field navigation. And without it, these sort of clip-on image-guided technologies it can be pretty misleading for TMS. Um, so just as a background, a little fun physics 101, because we all think physics is fun. Um, so in general, when you have a conductive surface that you introduce into an electromagnetic field, the E field can actually refract, right? And this is all based off of Snell's law. And you can reliably model all of these refractions if you know something about the shape of that conductive surface. So now in a human head, we tend to have these ions that align at different surfaces within the head. And so these surfaces can act like bioconductive surfaces, if you will. So when a human head is introduced into an electric field, which is exactly what happens during TMS, it can actually cause your stimulating electromagnetic field to refract. So it would be a gross oversight to assume that your TMS stimulating field is always running perpendicular to the face of your stimulating coil. And that's what those clip-on navigation methods do. And we call that line navigation. Um, but when it comes to Nexim, we know a lot about the shape of those bioconductive surfaces in the brain because we have the patient's own MRI. And we use these very advanced mathematical modeling methods called E-field modeling that can actually calculate those refractions. And it's updating in real time with the navigation. So as you're moving the coil around, it's continually recalculating the location and the strength of that stimulating field within the brain so that you can be confident that you're stimulating the intended target. And this is all validated in neurosurgery to be accurate on the order of millimeters. Pretty amazing. We do get questions about, you know, how deep can TMS stimulate? And so one of the really unique things about Nextim is that when you're using this e-field modeling, you can actually calculate the stimulation intensity that's being received by a target inside the brain, regardless of the depth. Right. Um, and that's very different from the other technologies where you just know the intensity leaving the coil itself. So you could have visual confirmation and quantitative confirmation, whether whatever your target is, regardless of the depth, is actually receiving enough stimulation to be able to have that treatment effect you're looking for. Thank you very much. Uh, so important. And working in epilepsy surgery, I know how it is important to really evaluate and target a very specific areas in the brain. And we are using a variety of different methodologies just to create an individual map of a single person. Because for 
clinical applications and precise applications that is absolutely imperative. And sometimes students ask uh, me, why don't we use just an average information about anatomy of the brain? Because we have it all the same. Actually, it's not the same in every individual. And also it changes, especially in patients with clinical conditions. And probably we will talk a little bit more about this later when the areas can reorganize to adjacent areas in the brain or even reorganize to the opposite hemisphere. Yes, that also happens. Absolutely. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now, can you tell us about the development and progress of the NBT system and its clearance by the FDA for marketing and uh, commercial distribution uh, for major de- depressive disorder treatment? Yep. So Nexen received FDA clearance for the treatment of major depressive disorder using our NBT system back in 2017. And there's actually been a lot of advances in the field since then, um, most notably the introduction of a new stimulating protocol. It's called the intermittent beta purse stimulation. Um, And that uses these bursts of 50 Hertz stimulation instead of the traditional train of 10 Hertz. And so in late 2018, we obtained another FDA clearance for Theta Burst, and that actually was able to reduce the treatment delivery time for major depressive disorder from about 37 minutes down to three minutes. Thank you. And it also brought me to a question of long-term effects. I think this is what everybody is always curious about. How long does the effect of the treatment last? How frequently patients need to come and repeat the protocol again? That's a great question. And it's very dependent upon the patient itself. So the goal really is to go through one round of TMS treatments and just be one and done. So a round of treatments, it typically takes a few weeks. They found if you have one TMS treatment, you might see short-term results, but if you can return to the same spot again and again and again, then you can achieve long-term results. Um, And so then it's a matter of, you know, after you go through one round of treatments, how long does that last? And so for some individuals, that's all they need. Sometimes they just um, rebalanced their system and they were able to you know, exit from their treatment sessions and, and that was it. And they were on their way and they never need to come back again. Um, sometimes people might, after six months or a year, they might end up kind of falling back down a little bit and they need to get kind of nudged back into that rebalanced brain state. And so sometimes what they do is they offer maintenance treatments. So it's not a full round of treatments, but they might come back in for a periodic treatment once in a while. And then it's sometimes people, you know, for, for whatever reason, it could be external reasons, it could be biological reasons, for whatever reason, some people return for a full round of treatments. But in each of these times, you know, people have seen benefits from these treatments um, to get them back to where they need to be. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And people also often ask about the possibility of inducing seizures by using uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So w- when we are providing trains of stimuli for the brain, the concern is that it can cause seizures. Can you elaborate more on that? And if there are any safety concerns or precautions that uh, you are aware of? Yeah, so all TMS manufacturers out there are obligated to inform patients that TMS can induce seizures, but it's actually considered very rare. Um, The risk is very low, much, much less than 1%. Um, Some of the cases out there where seizures were reported were actually caused by non-navigated technology. So what they were doing was they were searching around with a simulator, trying to find the motor cortex, um, and they were having trouble finding it, mainly because they didn't have an MRI. Right. And so they were hunting around. Um, they would increase the stimulation again and again and again. Um, and then they ended up hitting a spot with a higher stimulation than they actually needed. And they 
triggered a seizure. So technically, TMS, yes, can induce a seizure. So with next in safety data, we had this study of about 733 patients. This is uh, from Terrapur et al., 2015. Now, this was a tumor case. This was a bunch of patients going in for neurosurgery. And half of these tumor patients, they actually presented with seizures secondary to the tumor, right? Sometimes that's how people find out that they have a tumor. It's because one day they just have a seizure. So what they found with 733 patients, a very you know big study, TMS did not induce a seizure in any of these patients. And, you know, half these patients were obviously very susceptible to seizures. So it is considered very safe. But since it has occurred with some TMS manufacturers, you know, this method is technically able to induce a seizure. Now, the shape of the stimulating coil is a factor here. So figure of eight coils like Nexim and actually the majority of the TMS manufacturers out there, they have a particularly low rate of inducing seizures. So when they kind of combined the rates from a bunch of different devices that were using the figure of eight coil, and they also included the non-navigated technology here, it has a rate of 0.14 per 1,000 patients. Um, of inducing a seizure. Whereas there's another type of coil called an H coil. And that coil will actually stimulate a much larger region of the head. And that has significantly higher risk of inducing a seizure. So that's more like 5.56 per 1,000 patients. So again, it is rare. And also it's actually not even very easy to do to try to induce a seizure using TMS. So they've tried to do this for epilepsy patients where they brought in a TMS system and they tried to induce a seizure because they wanted to try to localize where the seizures were coming from. And they actually decided that TMS was not a good method to try to do this because they couldn't actually get it to induce a seizure when they wanted to, right? So the risk is technically there, but it is very low. Thank you so much. It's good to know. Any other side effects that people can expect coming to the TMS session? Yeah. So the most common side effect is headaches. It occurs in about half of them, but usually it just happens. Um, so if they're having treatments, usually it'll just happen the first week and then it typically goes away. Um, and sometimes they can feel a sensation on their scalp. It's like a, just a feeling of discomfort that they might feel, but that's about it. Otherwise it's, it's considered really low risk, but we do, you know, disclose the, the risk of seizures, even though it is very low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is the earliest age at which people can participate in uh, TMS treatment? Yeah. So, you know, TMS is used for brain mapping and then also for TMS treatment. Most of the studies that are FDA cleared only included adults. So there are some clinical trials right now to try to expand upon that to see if we can get help to younger children as well. So I don't want to comment too much on that. I don't want to try to promote use for a population that is not already FDA cleared, but they are looking to see if they can help individuals who are very young. Now on the brain mapping side, one of the things that's really unique about Nextim is that a lot of pediatrics don't have access to, say, fMRI, because when they are doing that, they actually have to be awake in a MRI machine um, to be able to do these motor tasks. And so, one, it's very intimidating to be in one of those MRI machines, so they're typically sedated. But two, you have to be able to follow commands. Well, Nextim is really unique in that our motor mapping is actually passive. So they've actually been able to do motor mapping on these children as young as eight weeks old. Yes, I've heard about a hospital that is using and very successfully navigated TMS for functional mapping for epilepsy surgery. So, yeah, beautiful. And I also was very curious when you were explaining how different coils can provide different stimulation and are there any indications for which you would use one type of coil and for other indications, another type of coil, or you're basically using the same type of coil for all the indications? How does it usually work? Well, I think that the 
H coil was really introduced because they were looking at an indication where there's a strong belief that it's not just impacting one discrete location, but in fact, that there is this brain network that's a little bit larger. So they tried to make this brain stimulator that would treat a larger brain network and not just one discrete site. But then I'll tell you a little story about a system being used not for an FDA cleared indication, but actually for for research and why it's important to have a perhaps more focal coil. So what happened was at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess, they're using their system. It's a figure of eight coil. So it's a much more focal coil than this eight coil. And they wanted to look to see with a, the Asperger's community, if you could treat them and see changes with their naming skills, with you know language skills. And so they were testing to see if they could stimulate specific areas within the Broca's area. Broca's is an area that controls language. Um, and they were actually looking at some substructures. So what they found was that with one group, they decided to treat the left pars triangularis and another group, they were treating the left pars opicularis. Now, these are relatively small structures, but they're also adjacent to each other. And actually what they found was that when they were stimulating the left pars triangularis, they saw improved naming skills. And it was the exact opposite when they were trying to treat the left pars opicularis. So it's really important if you're going for different indications, different conditions to really understand the area surrounding the area that you're trying to target to know just how much leeway they, there is, right? And just how important it is to have a very focal coil, you know, whether you want to try to avoid actually treating the adjacent area. Yes, that makes total sense. We already a little bit touched upon the CE mark in Europe for other uses of the NBT system. So can you tell a little bit more about that and about this treatment of neuropathic pain? Absolutely. So this is already available in Europe. Like I said, it has a CE mark. Um, we are hoping to do some trials in the United States and that way we can get people access to this type of care. We have a lot of centers who are, are very interested in it. So I do think that that is something that we will be seeing. But like I said, this is an RTMS treatment where you're really looking to um, disrupt this signal before it's registered as pain. Um, and it really needs this you know, navigation technology because a patient can very clearly tell you where they're feeling pain. And then you can very easily go in using the TMS system to map out in the brain the exact area that's controlling that sensation and be able to treat that. Um, so there's a couple of different protocols. One will actually treat the motor area and the other will treat the adjacent sensory area. And so it's just depending on the patient, um, which one ends up working for them. But yeah, it's exciting. It, I'm hopefully that this is something we can bring to the U.S. soon. I also hope so. Can you give examples of clinical cases where next team equipment made a significant difference in patient treatment and treatment outcomes? For example, brain surgery. Absolutely. So we are also FDA cleared for motor and language mapping um, to use preoperatively. And so I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. And these are both, you know, on label use that, you know, adhere to our, our clinical indication. So the first one, is out of Le Bonheur Children's Hospital. And so this was actually published by Narayana et al. 2019. So they had this four-year-old who was suffering from seizures because of Rasmussen encephalitis. And they were actually able to localize where the seizures were coming from. And it was in fact the area on the left temporal lobe that typically contains language. So it was really essential that they knew where language function resided in this particular child's brain to make sure that they knew whether it was safe to operate the area that was triggering these seizures. But then unfortunately for this patient, as well as you know many young patients, this is something I mentioned before, they're just not eligible for non-invasive awake task-based motor and language mapping using fMRI or MEG because it's just really intimidating to go into those scanners by themselves. Um, and so they typically have to be sedated. And unfortunately, 
for this patient. They also failed some other evaluations, one of which is called a WADA test. So the WADA test aims to tell you which side of the brain controls different functions, and the results were just inconclusive. And then because this was a pediatric patient, they also knew that they were not going to be able to do interoperative language mapping because that requires just a considerable amount of maturity. Um, you have to actually wake up a patient in the middle of surgery while the brain is exposed to do these language mapping tasks. And it is just not an option for a four-year-old. So these standard brain mapping techniques failed this child. And this is typically what happens with most pediatric cases. Um, but fortunately, these guys have an extum system. So they were able to do bilateral mapping with NTMS, and they were able to determine that the patient's language function, which typically resides on the left side of the brain, it had largely relocated to the right hemisphere. And what's incredible about this is that even if they went under some invasive mapping, where they placed some subdural grids and strips um, in the patient's brain, and then they bring them to the ICU and they monitor them for a couple of weeks. And this is often very needed to, to do, especially if you're trying to localize seizures. But if they were trying to do that just to localize the function, well, they actually would not have been able to see that the function relocated because you don't actually map the unaffected hemisphere with these invasive techniques, right? So they would have missed it. Um, and based off of the functional reorganization, for language that was seen with Nexstem, they actually deemed that this little child was in fact suitable for surgery. So they did this left functional hemispherectomy and the child didn't have any language deficits after surgery. Um, and this would have been deemed inoperable had they not had Nexstem. So um, I'll give you one more story here. This one is an adult tumor case. Um, also, this one was published by Takahashi et al. back in 2012. Um, so this was an adult male and he came in with a tumor right smack dab in the middle of the motor cortex. And in fact, with Nextim, it showed that motor function existed within the tumor itself, meaning that if they resected that area of the tumor where there was function, then that patient was likely going to suffer from paresis, right? So they, they still went in for surgery but they did it really safely and they only resected the part of the tumor that also like did not control motor. And so then when the patient came in months later for a follow-up visit, unfortunately they saw that this tumor was growing back really quickly. So they went, they went back in and they took a little bit more out, but then here's where things get interesting. So months later, that patient came back in for another follow-up visit and they did a next stem motor mapping. And when they did that, everybody was shocked by what they saw. So the function was actually no longer in the tumor itself, but it had actually relocated to the sensory cortex. And so the doctor and the patient, they were looking at the next map and they discussed all the, the risks and they agreed they wanted to go in and try to remove the entire tumor. And then when they were in surgery, they did intraoperative motor mapping where you're directly stimulating the brain. And in fact, when they did that, they were able to confirm for the hand area that the hand control now resided in the sensory cortex, which was very surprising. Um, but when they tried to map the legs with direct cortical stimulation, which is considered the gold standard for mapping, well, it failed them. They actually couldn't get a response with the stimulator when they were in surgery. They kept increasing the stimulation intensity more and more and more until it just maxed out. And it maxes out. You don't want to go too high because you can induce a seizure um, in the OR. And sometimes that just happens. Sometimes you just can't get a response, even though there's indeed function there. But these surgeons were really confident in the next in data that they had. So they went ahead and they took out the entire tumor. And then the patient ended up not having any surgery-related deficits after that case. So there's a lot of really amazing stories like this. I honestly could go on and on and on. Um, it is pretty easy to work for a company like Nextim when you can see just how much it can help these patients. 
Absolutely. And talking about transfer or reorganization of function to another area, are you aware of any work that is being done in this field to have this process before the surgery, so-called prehabilitation? Yeah, this is a really exciting area. This is brand new and it's actually just kind of theoretical at this point when it comes to TMS. So definitely, definitely investigational at this point, not FDA cleared. But the idea behind prehabilitation is whether we can actually use TMS to induce plasticity, right? And so for these cases where function resides in the tumor itself, you know, can we use TMS to coax the function away to an adjacent area so that we can actually resect more of the tumor and ideally the entire tumor? So like I said, theoretical right now, using TMS for this purpose, it, this is mainly being highlighted by Professor Defoe out of the University of Montpelier in France, but it is backed up by science. So we've actually seen this idea work when we're using the invasive electrical stimulation with the subdural grids. Um, a lot of this is work coming out of Spain. And this is, you know, what you were doing before. This is really exciting stuff. So just a couple of considerations as we're kind of getting into this space, we're really testing out to see if prehabilitation is going to work with TMS. So one, it takes a little bit of time to, you know, coax the function away. And so for high grade glioma tumors, you know, it actually probably benefits the patient most if they don't wait, you know, a, a month or two to attempt something like this. They really want to take out that tumor as fast as possible because it does grow so fast. But then with low-grade gliomas, I think that's really where the focus is with this type of prehabilitation technique. This tumor tends to grow more slowly. So you may have the opportunity to try to induce plasticity over a period of weeks. And then I also think that candidates who are undergoing radiation therapy might also likely be candidates because those treatments too are kind of rolled out over a longer period of time. Um, and so this is one of those really extraordinary advances, or perhaps we say advances to be, that if it proves to be able to do this non-invasively using TMS and not just with those subdural grids and strips, which are really invasive, if they can do this non-invasively with TMS, it could be an entire paradigm shift on how we approach neurosurgery in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And so many people who are considered unoperable at the moment, they might get a chance of having brain surgery and actually getting better. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Can you speak to the experience of working with Next Team and any notable achievements or advancements in the field of TMS and neurotechnology? Yeah, honestly, I think that the most notable achievement was just being able to have neurosurgical grade accuracy with TMS, where it can actually be used reliably for pre-surgical treatment planning. Um, and it's a huge achievement to have FDA clearance for that because it means that patients can actually get access to this level of care at a clinical level and not just through you know, research labs. And then on the neuromodulation side, I think one of the biggest achievements was that Nextin came in and really changed the entire mental health field. We aim to show people just how important it was to be able to see where you're treating patients. Um, and now the field is demanding that type of capability. And it's not just enough to have the navigation, but they're also recognizing that e-field modeling is critical too. So actually, if you want to get an NIH grant for RTMS studies, the NIMH is mandating that you also include e-field modeling, right? So... With Nextim, Nextim is the only TMS system out there that offers this fully integrated e-field modeling that's, that's tracking live, you know, as you are using the system. And so I think these achievements that we're making are, they're really pushing the entire field to advance in a way that I think is really incredibly important for patients. Yes, that's beautiful. And I'm very curious, what innovations in the Neurotech are inspiring you? And what would you like to do in the future? What would be your vision of using current innovations in Neurotech in the future? 
Yeah. So, um, I mean, sky's the limit, really. There are just a lot of people out there that have neurological and psychiatric disorders who have just run out of options, right? There are no other treatments left for them, right? And, and we haven't given up yet. So we have researchers who are studying all of these different areas using TMS. They're having very good preliminary results with these methods. And it's absolutely incredible. We have these other technologies like DBS, right? And that's wonderful and great. And it's absolutely amazing what it can do, but some people are not eligible for surgery, right? There's a lot of people right now who are left out um, in all different types of neurological conditions and psychiatric conditions. So I really think that TMS is going to be able to kind of come through for these people and make sure that they know that we haven't given up on them, that there is hope. Um, and it could be for just so many different conditions out there. Yeah. So those were the main challenges. Yes. And opportunities in the field of TMS that you would like to address or are there any others that? Yeah. So we have seen some advancements with spinal cord injury. There's a lot of work by Anastasia Shoga out of the Helsinki University Hospital who is working on this. And for me, you know, I'm seeing that there's these dramatic improvements with patients who have kind of the most severe condition, right? They are actually paralyzed. I, mean, I would really love to see this where our researchers kind of cast a wider net and they go into actually spine surgery where we have patients who have come in with mild or moderate stenosis um, already having weakness and can TMS be something that we can offer many, many people, not just with paralysis, but coming out of spine surgeries with deficits. There is an extraordinary number of uses that we may be able to see if TMS is an application for. But of course, this is all investigational and it's theoretical and, you know, something that's just my hopes and dreams. But uh, we do have a lot of researchers out there and there are so many more opportunities to try TMS for for different conditions. Yeah. And can you discuss any current or upcoming projects or research initiatives at Next Team that you are particularly excited about? Yeah, there's actually so many. I'm going to have to like narrow it down and I feel bad that I can't talk about all of them. But before there's, I do this, I want to emphasize that these things that I'll tell you about, they are currently being evaluated on a research level. Okay, so as of today, February 2023, they're not FDA cleared at this time. Okay, so it's for investigational use only in the US. Okay, I don't want to come across like I'm promoting this, um, but we are watching these research areas really closely to see how they develop. So one, I was just starting to talk about it actually. This is about Anastasia Shulga out of the Helsinki University Hospital where she's using TMS for spinal cord injury rehabilitation. So I'll just tell you a little bit more about it. And so she's evaluating a technique that's called paired associative stimulation. So she's actually combining the NTMS with peripheral nerve stimulation. So that's where you're stimulating the arms and the legs. And so she's looking to see if we can help these patients regain the use of their limbs after they've been paralyzed from spinal cord injury. And so what she's looking to do is she's taking the TMS to activate neurons in a very specific area of the motor cortex. And then she sends those downward signals through the damaged spinal cord toward the affected limb. And then using the peripheral nerve stimulation, she's stimulating the limbs and she's aiming to send that upward signal orthodromically so that it collides with the downward TMS pulses at the level of the spinal cord. And so the goal is for these very carefully timed pulses to strengthen the connections in the damaged spinal cord. And so far, the results look really promising and she's actually going through a larger clinical trial right now to better evaluate the technique. So I'm really looking forward to those results, hopefully soon. Um, she actually did a webinar with us where she showed some incredible before and after videos. So if you're interested, you can actually check those out on the Next and Podium page of our company website. Um, and so another study that I'll tell you about is actually won an award and um, this is out of the Technical University of Munich. So these guys are using RTMS to treat patients who are suffering from post-surgical paresis. And during an earlier study um, a while back, they showed that, you know, if you're using the best brain mapping technology to avoid resecting the functional tissue itself, 
then 70% of the time you're getting post-surgical deficits, it's actually a result of ischemia, right? So some type of vascular structure was compromised. So in a paper that they published by Il et al, um, 2021, um, Sebastian Ila and Sandra Krieg and their entire team, they did a randomized double-blinded trial using a protocol that was previously being evaluated as a treatment for stroke. And they demonstrated some really impressive results where compared to the control group, NTMS significantly improved outcomes after just seven days of treatment. And each of these treatments included um, an RTMS session followed by a physical therapy session. So if you want to learn more about that, um, Professor Craig also presented this study in one of our webinars. So you can check that out too on the next Empodium page. Um, and then I'll give you one more story, although oh, there's so many. So you may have seen it in the news. Mayo Clinic used a next MTMS system for seizure suppression. So this news story that came out of Mayo Rochester, um, it was about this individual who was not responding to anti-epileptic medication, and he was not a candidate for surgery, and he was having upwards of 200 seizures per day. So out of options, they used this treatment protocol that had previously been studied at Boston Children's. And this individual went in for treatment back in 2020. And when I spoke to somebody from their lab last spring, so that was in 2022, they said he was still doing great and he was still seizure free. So again, I want to make sure that you guys all know that these are not FDA cleared at this time. Um, these are all for investigational use only in the U.S., but we are looking forward to see how some larger follow-up studies pan out. Yes, it just shows how many opportunities do we have ahead of us. And it brings me to the next question. How do you see the field of TMS and neurotechnology evolving in the next 5, 10, or 20 years? Yeah, so, you know, I don't want to speak for next time here, but just in my own personal opinion, I think in the next five years, we can expect to see more widespread use of TMS for the treatment of many, many more neurological and psychiatric conditions. And then in you know, 10 years, I think we're going to be seeing more ways to personalize treatment even further. So I think we're going to be seeing some very new, very strategic ways to deliver TMS pulses to make them even more effective. There are you know, currently some closed loop methods currently being tested. So we'll, we'll see if that enters the clinical phase you know, in the upcoming years. And then I think if we look way ahead in, in 20 years, I'm really inspired by the work by Alex Rotenberg out of Boston Children's when I say this, but I'm hoping that TMS is going to be an integral part of managing a variety of neurological disorders. I think we're going to be seeing TMS being used to identify biomarkers that can help diagnose neurological conditions, and then really importantly, be able to match up patients with the right drug treatment and then get it right the first time. Um, and I also think that TMS is going to play a major role in developing new pharmaceuticals. So like I said, a lot of this is already in motion, um, especially at a Boston Children's, but I sincerely do hope that this is what the standard of care looks like in 20 years, because there is a lot of room for improvement right now. Yeah. And I'm very curious about what you think about the combination of brain-computer interfaces and transcranial magnetic stimulation. Where do you see this conjunction going, developing in the future, if you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> I think I could spend an entire hour on it. Um, so one of the you know special things about brain-computer interface is the way that computational modeling works. Um, you don't necessarily need to know what's happening under the hood um, you can kind of deal with that with a lot of the algorithms. Um, but I think that there are a lot of insights that can be offered, especially with a NextM TMS system. Um, I think that it kind of shows that the motor homunculus is not necessarily as um, elementary as some of our textbooks show. So I think that a lot of these guys in the BCI world, um, it would be great if they came by 
um, and checked out what a next to motor map would do, I think that it might change the design of those BCI interfaces. Um, and they may not want them to be quite so small. They may be able to see that there's a lot of opportunity if they actually um, increase the surface area a little bit just because of how the motor strip is organized. It can be really surprising. And then some of these BCI guys, as well as there's this new breed of electrical cortical simulators that are more on the minimally invasive side. This is all on the horizon. They are potentially going to treat patients using this new form of stimulator. So some of the BCI guys have touted the fact that they have the ability to stimulate the brain. And so we'll have to see if they're going to use that for neuromodulation or if they're just going to use that for some type of haptic feedback to you know, give patients a better experience when they're engaging with the world. But then there are some companies right now in clinical trials where they are trying to use these minimally invasive stimulators that are implants. And I think that they are going to leverage off of the decades of work that's been done in TMS, and it's going to help them advance very rapidly. With the insights that they can afford, especially on the patient monitoring side, I think that the TMS community is going to learn a lot from those advances. So I think we're really going to see this, this combined effort where we all learn from each other and we all start advancing very rapidly because of how we can all help each other out. Yes, absolutely. What do you see as the potential for TMS and neurotechnology in terms of improving patient outcomes and quality of life? Yeah, so I really see it as the ultimate modality for personalized medicine, right? We have high accuracy. We have these personalized stimulation levels. And honestly, we have this untapped reserve of potential new stimulation protocols. Um, and it's not invasive. So we're already seeing what it's capable of, especially with the research on spinal cord injury rehab and the treatment for post-surgical paresis. Um, it's absolutely incredible how much this technology can improve the quality of life for patients. And so I really have high hopes, basically for any condition out there who has brain circuitry that can travel up through the cortex and be tapped into using TMS, right? Because TMS can access the, the cortex. So if their brain circuitry is traveling through there, maybe there is hope and maybe we can really improve the quality of life for many, many people. Yes. And now we are getting into a question of ethics and regulatory considerations. As the neurotechnologies are developing, there are more and more ethical dilemmas and discussions and concerns, especially as it pertains to uh, stimulation. Some people, we had a talk with Alan McKay from Australia, a law and criminology expert. He was saying that we can potentially in the future use brain stimulation or certain offenders who might be too aggressive so we can modulate their prefrontal cortex and other areas of the brain and allow them to live with that stimulator instead of let's say going to prison because in this way we are avoiding and preventing them from that mm, aggression and so on and so forth but how ethical is that so there are many many questions so can you discuss any ethical or regulatory considerations surrounding the use of TMS and neurotechnology in medical treatment? Yeah, so maybe I'll start off with the regulatory side. Um, so we do have some you know, contraindications to try to keep things safe. Individuals who have metal in their head, you know, not including dental, but um, I'm thinking more like aneurysm clips, those individuals as well as people who have electronics implanted in their body, so pacemakers, those are a contraindication for TMS. So unfortunately, they would not be able to receive TMS. And then on the ethical side, um, that's a really interesting story that you said, I'm not even sure what, um, how I feel about that. <laughs> but I think that there are a lot of ethical considerations when we're talking about neurotechnology. One of the things that comes up most often actually more applies to implants or sensors that can record patient brain data. And I just want to say that TMS alone cannot do that. So TMS itself is unidirectional. So it's not recording or analyzing brain data. So 
patient privacy is really a non-issue with TMS when it comes to that sort of thing. And then the other big ethical consideration that I can think of off the top of my head is whether neuromodulation can give a consumer some type of advantage. So for those of you in the field, you might know the term neurodoping. And so for those of you who don't know, neurodoping is this unauthorized use of enhancing one's brain for sport. So they could also use this perhaps for trying to be a better musical instrument player. And so the way they do this, it, they prime the brain with the brain stimulation just prior to practicing. And they think that this may give somebody an unfair advantage in their ability to have better mind control. Uh, well, I guess body mind control. There's actually one of these that already exists. This company actually sold themselves to another company, but it, it's still out there. And this device did show positive evidence of neurodoping and it was not TMS. This was a, a much smaller device. Um, it's a, a convenient at home device and it's actually relatively inexpensive. And so I think that it's pretty unlikely that somebody on the consumer side is even going to think about TMS for neurodoping because that other device is already out there, right? Um, and with TMS, at least today, it's not an at-home treatment. So you actually have to go into a clinic for it. It's just not as convenient. So I don't think that is something that would um, ever come up in ethical debates regarding brain stimulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And talking about neurodoping, there are many reports of young people using electrical current stimulation during gaming when they need to stay awake and they are trying to help themselves to stay alert and awake by stimulating the brain which, you know, it obviously can have some undesired consequences. So there are many concerns, but the most important that in your devices, you know about all the safety, making sure that it's safe for use. And can you speak to any obstacles or challenges you have faced in your career and how have you overcome them? Yes, as far as challenges in my own career, um, you know, I, I don't want to say it, but I do, because I think there's going to be a lot of people out there who can relate. And I'm actually really happy to share it because it does have a, a happy ending. So one of my biggest career challenges was actually having a kid, um, not a challenge in a bad way, but it did force me to do a, you know, career pivot, if you will. But what a blessing, right? Both having my, my kid and then also this career change that it led to. So after I had my son, I was no longer able to work these kind of unpredictable OR hours, but that gave me the opportunity to take on a completely different role where I was able to learn the back end of the business. So R&D and regulatory and operational side of commercialization. Um, and honestly, I don't know how or if that tra transition ever would have happened had I not really needed to make it happen, but I ended up learning um, a tremendous amount, and it has definitely opened up a lot of opportunities for me as well. Yeah, and it also provided an opportunity for you to utilize all that knowledge that you already acquired in different directions, in different ways. Absolutely, absolutely. It's been really fun, um, and I think I've been able to be a much stronger contributor um, on this on the backside um, because of all of that experience that I had beforehand. And what advice would you give to students or young professionals interested in pursuing a career in neuroscience and neurotechnology, and maybe specifically in TMS? <laughs> you know, if you want a career in neuroscience or neurotech, there's definitely some classes that I recommend. Um, so if you, you know, want to go to this, you should probably be really well-rounded. I think that everybody should take at least one basic computer science course um, just to get the logic down. Um, you should also take genetics and engineering, obviously some medical classes like anatomy and neuroscience. All of those things are very helpful for TMS. Um, but I am going to say that there are a couple classes that not only should you take them, but I think you should do whatever it takes to not get rusty. So one is stats and the other is linear algebra. And so stats, you can never get enough stats. Um, a lot of conferences have these stats refresher courses if you look close enough. 
Um, and it, I didn't think it matters what part of your career you're in. I think you should always elect for those stats refresher courses whenever you see it. Um, and then linear algebra, even for TMS, right? Um, linear algebra is still really helpful. It is, you know, the basis for AI and machine learning. It's obviously going to be the fabric of our future. And it can be used for both the product side and the business side. So, you know, even with TMS, there are some applications for this. Um, and I do want to say that if you end up getting rusty with linear algebra, I recommend watching a semester of it on MIT Open Courseware. It's free. I actually did it myself right before taking computational modeling in grad school because that was 10 years after I went to undergrad and I had forgotten everything. So highly recommend it or just maybe don't get rusty in the first place is probably the best advice. And then the last bit of advice that I'll share with all of you is with regards to how important it is to get clinical patient experience first. You know, how we always say first impressions are important when you meet somebody new, uh, they really are, right? They bias us. I think it kind of puts up this lens, this filter through which we learn new things different about them. And I think the same goes for neurotech. I think your first experiences working in the field, it really puts up this filter and it changes everything else we learn in the future. It, it forever influences what we feel is important. And it is so important, especially in medical device, that we're always putting the patients first. So it doesn't matter whether you work in R&D or research or marketing or on the business side or sales. I think that one of the very best things that you can do for yourself is to get patient and clinical experience very early on in your career. I think it can shape your perspective in the best possible way. And then when you end up being able to really contribute to the field, it's going to help ensure that you're really considering the patients when you're making decisions. Yes, thank you for this wonderful advice. Two things came to my mind when I was listening to it. One is neuroanatomy that you mentioned. I'm just curious, maybe there are even some courses that help people to realize what, what is needed when you are working already specifically uh, TMS and uh, location of the coil on the head of the person. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely courses you can take. And actually for us, a lot of times we, we go in with our system, the TMS system, and we know that people have not necessarily even seen an MRI. So it's definitely part of our training that we will teach people how to look at those MRIs and how to identify particular targets on the MRI. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We just had a podcast with Andreas Forsland, the CEO and the founder of the company Cognition. And one of the things he said that he wakes up every morning, he asks himself, what new can I learn today? So you had the whole set of the things <laughs> that now our listeners who are interested in the field can start doing. They can ask, okay, what I can learn uh, today to get into this field. And there are so many wonderful things, uh, including linear algebra and neuroanatomy and many other important things. And we even know where to go and find those courses. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> okay. What was the most unexpected thing you learned over the years of your neuroscience neurotechnology work? So, you know, I've seen a lot of things. I've seen amazing things, surprising things, um, all kinds of things. But I'm, maybe I'll answer this a little bit different just because of who's probably listening to this. And hopefully it ends up being helpful to somebody listening. So in neurotech and in neurosurgery, the stakes are really high, right? Um, it's a lot of risk involved. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's, the stakes are high. So this is a field that has this foundation that's built off of trust and respect. It's just a different breed than a lot of other industries out there. And so something that I think people may not realize is that, you know, even if you do everything perfectly your whole life, you may not actually be building trust in your relationships with your colleagues. And that really is one of the ultimate goals in this field. So you know, how do you build trust if it's not about doing things right all the time? 
you know, things go wrong. Hopefully they don't. Sometimes they do. The very worst thing that you can do is to pretend it wasn't you, right? To, you know, hide the peas under the plate. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just can't do that in neurotech. And some people are under the impression that you should do whatever you can to not admit fault. But those guys can work in a different industry, maybe the finance industry, but but not in the OR, right? This is neurotech. So if you do admit that something has not gone as expected, and, and maybe something doesn't even have to go wrong, but that you're faced with a big, big challenge, um, and then you handle it really, really well. The most unexpected thing that I learned is that handling things well can earn you lifelong trust with even the most intimidating of neurosurgeons. And this isn't just speaking to people at, say, an entry level. This goes all the way up to CEOs and, and at a corporate level. So there's this example in the neurotech industry. This was not Nextim. This happened with an implant company. Um, and unfortunately, something went not as expected. And unfortunately for them, it was very, very public that this happened. And I think for them, this was one of the defining moments for them as a company, right? How they chose to handle that, I think was going to decide whether the entire neurotech community and patients would end up trusting them and respecting them. Or if they handled it differently, it would probably be the exact opposite, right? So the most unexpected thing that I learned was just how monumental it is in the neurotech industry to handle things really, really well, especially if something goes not as expected. Yes. And I would like to disclose our listeners that this is our second podcast recording. And the first time I didn't press the record button, when, <laughs> which I thought I did. And we needed to re-record this podcast and I felt so horrible. But I remembered what Catherine told about trust <laughs> <laughs> and, and really importance of disclosing things as they are not hiding things. And I decided I will just say as it is, I will explain and we will see what happened. And Catherine so graciously agreed to re-record the podcast. So thank you very much. And for this advice, I used it and I hopefully <laughs> it, it helped. It helped and, and our trust and now we will have a wonderful podcast. So I <laughs> appreciate it. Um, and what helps you in your career development? Um, honestly, it's my teammates. You know, we all care so much. We care for the patients and customers and for the company and for each other. Um, and it really pushes me to make sure that I never let anybody else down. And honestly, they're the same way. They really support me in a lot of ways that help me to succeed as well. And we're all really open about what it is that we want for our future. So when we do notice some opportunity that lines up with somebody's career development goals, we really try to carve out space for them. And we really try to match up the right people for the right work. So in that way, I think we all play a huge role in each other's career development. And this just, you know, may be one of those very special bonuses um, that comes along when you work for a very small company, just something that we get to do. Yes, absolutely. And what was one thing in your career that seemed impossible, but you were able to prove it was possible? And how did you do it? Yeah, so historically, there's been a number of conditions where they're just has been no treatment solution. So no hope at all. And spinal cord injury is one of those, right? This has just been deemed impossible to treat. Um, there's usually this period of time after an injury where we look to see if some type of intervention can help, but many times it doesn't, right? And then trying to continue offering treatment is deemed futile. And if that happens, patients may no longer be eligible for rehab programs. It's just everybody seems to give up. Um, so one of the studies that I mentioned earlier, it really challenged that. There's the work by Anastasia Shulga 
So using this really smart protocol based off of the principle of heavy and learning, she's demonstrating that it's actually possible to get people out of wheelchairs and improve agility in their hands that were just once non-functional. Um, and again, I said it earlier, but this is not FDA cleared at the time. So in the US, at least, it is for investigational use only. But it does seem that, you know, just yesterday, there was absolutely no hope for people with spinal cord injuries who are left paralyzed. And now the impossible is technically possible. It's just a matter of getting patients all around the world access at a clinical level. And how do you approach making the impossible possible in your work? Yeah, so I think that, you know, making the impossible possible is all about creativity. And I think Steve Jobs probably said it best when he said creativity is just about connecting the dots. So connecting people and connecting ideas. I think when it comes to connecting the right people, it's really great to you know, curate your teams with people who are coming in with all different perspectives. But then you also need to give them a very innovative environment where they can all share their ideas, that they can inspire each other, and you can really compile all of their ideas. But you can't expect the people sitting in the room right there to collectively have all of the answers for tomorrow, say, just based off of their prior experience coming in. I think it's really important that we, especially in the neurotech community, really try to keep up with the latest advances in the field and not just in our own little field, but with other modalities as well. So Nexon had a recent breakthrough. Um, and I talked about this earlier where researchers were testing to see if TMS could be used to treat patients with post-op paresis. Again, it's not FDA cleared, it's for investigational use only. But the idea of using this to treat patients with post-op paresis, it was inspired by researchers using the same technology to see if they could treat patients suffering from stroke deficits. Okay, so there's this group of tumor neurosurgeons that needed to be very well read on the latest advancements in stroke rehabilitation to be able to come up with this. And if these larger studies proved to be successful, this could reverse paresis for a number of surgery patients. It's absolutely incredible. So really what I think it takes to make the impossible possible is getting people together with different perspectives, but then also making sure we're keeping up to date with the latest advancements and not just in our little niche fields, but also the other fields and other modalities as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. One more question regarding careers and employment opportunities. You mentioned how supportive you all are to each other. You have a certain atmosphere between the employees. How do you approach the hiring of new people who would like to join your team? What are the qualities that are you looking for in people who want to join you? Yeah, so Nextim can really do so much, right? Um, with the brain mapping side and the therapy side, and a lot of the technology we have integrates a lot of components. So MRI and clinical neurophysiology, image guidance, and then obviously there's a lot of knowledge behind different conditions in the neurosurgery world and also different conditions in the neurological and psychiatric world. So there's a lot of background information that's really helpful to have. And once you come on board, you kind of have to make sure you're able to learn all of that. So it's really helpful if somebody coming in already has some of that knowledge. Now, we could never imagine that somebody comes in with all of that knowledge, but it is really helpful if they have some of that knowledge. And then one of the things that we, when somebody is, you know, applying for a job, you know, it's, it's one thing. Um, if they have experience doing something that we need somebody to be able to do. But it's quite another if that is something that they actually enjoyed doing, because that is going to be your life, you know? So we want to make sure that when people come in, it's not just about the fact that they have experience doing something that we need done, um, but whether this is actually something that they really enjoy doing. 
it just brings me back to the very beginning of our conversation about having fun doing math and science. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> are, are they having fun with what they're doing? Yeah. Can you share where our listeners can learn more about your work and how they can get in touch with you? Absolutely. I think the best way to get in touch with me is LinkedIn. Feel free to connect. I love meeting new people. And then if you're curious about Nextim and you want to learn more, just go to our website, www.nextim.com. Um, and if you have any inquiries about Nextim, just email info at nextim.com. Mm -hmm. And we will add all that information to our podcast notes. Is there anything else you would like to to share with our listeners before we wrap up our podcast today. Yeah, so I'll just say it again. If you are looking for a career in neurotech, um, really give yourself that opportunity to learn about neuroscience a little bit before you get in there and really study it, right? Um, once you find that thing that really excites you, then just immerse yourself in it. Become an expert in that. And if you have the chance to get clinical and patient experience early on, that is wonderful. Um, I think if you can do all of that, it can make the work that you do really meaningful. And I think you can have an absolutely incredible career in neurotech. Thank you so much, Catherine, for this insightful, amazing conversation. I'm sure it will be so valuable for many, many of our listeners. So I appreciate you coming and talking about your experience, your career and navigated transcranial magnetic stimulation. Thank you so much. And I wish you and your company all possible success. Thank you. Thank you so much. 